Everyone said, amen. God bless you. You may be seated. All right. Well, of course, uh, as you came in, you have a uh, worship guide, and we're going to get to that in just a moment. Let me ask you this. Uh, how many of you, um, since we've been using the, the notes in the worship guide for a little bit, how many of you that's helped you? It's been good for you? All right. So overall, I think that's that's the consensus. And uh, so that's good. Of course, we'll continue to do that. And uh, just uh, uh, it's uh, it helps me to know that I'm uh, being able to help you even more. And of course, you know, uh, I always have more in my spirit than I do on the paper. And so uh, it's just good to know that, listen, I'll, I'll use this as a guide. But you know, if time to time we may go off of that, I always want to endeavor to follow the Holy Spirit. But at least you have the material there that even if we don't get to all of it, uh, we've uh, been putting up on our website, getting, getting, getting better that, and I believe we're right at the place where we'll just have them uh, up every week within the next uh, day or so, next couple days, so that you can go ahead and reference them if you didn't get a hard copy for some reason. So uh, just use that as a guide and just know that we'll follow the Holy Spirit. If we don't get to everything, you still got something you can take home and study. How many appreciate something you can go back and look at? Praise God. So, hey, today we're going to start a new series, and the new series is entitled Money Talks. Money Talks. And, uh, and so just for a few weeks here, we're going to be on this uh, series and on this subject. And uh, today, in your worship guide, uh, you see the title there and a subtitle today. And that is the prosperous soul. Everyone say the prosperous soul. So that's what we're going to talk about today under the heading Money Talks. And uh, Ecclesiastes chapter 10 and verse number 19 uh, is where we're going to begin. And, uh, you know, I learned this in Bible school that uh, there are three modes out of which a pastor or a, a, a pastor can, can, can teach or preach. And one mode is by, by revelation, another mode is by uh, inspiration, and another mode is by observation. I'll explain those. But revelation means that uh, as a pastor, uh, something that I've studied and God has revealed to me in my own private study and time of chewing on the word, meditating, studying, and so forth, which is always ongoing about different things, God at a certain time will say, now, son, teach on this. Okay? Proclaim, exhort out of the revelation that I've given you from my word. Teach this to the people to impart and to equip and to build them up, to help them to be everything that God wants them to be. All right? that's, that's by revelation. And then there is by inspiration. And that is simply that uh, you didn't necessarily plan for it. You didn't necessarily uh, prepare, as it were, uh, months in advance. But by inspiration, the Holy Spirit moves upon you to preach or to teach or to exhort or to encourage from a particular area. And then the third one is by observation. And that's where, as a pastor, you have the opportunity as an under-shepherd, you care for the sheep. And you get to observe and, and just watch, and, and a good shepherd pays attention to things. And so uh, you preach out of a sense of, from observation, here is a need that I sense the Holy Spirit wants us to uh, be able to encourage his people in. Well, in this topic, Money Talks, I'm preaching from all three modes. <laughs> revelation out of what God has given me in my own time instead of the light that I have uh, at, at, at this point in my journey, I'm going to give that light to you. Amen? And then by inspiration, because I believe that while we're going, the Holy Spirit will always lead us and just download something instantaneous. And then by observation, just things that as a pastor, uh, over time, every now and then, I believe this is just a topic that the body of Christ and our church in particular needs to be encouraged in, and you need to be built up in and be educated and sharpened in. So that's what we're going to deal with, money talks. Here's why. Three basically reasons. Number one, Ecclesiastes 10, 19, it says, a feast is made for laughter, and wine makes merry, but money answers everything. And really what that is saying is that money is an important topic because really it touches every area of our lives. Am I right about that? Really money touches every area of our lives. It, it, it affects so many 
things. And uh, it, it, it uh, affects, of course, how certain decisions are made. It affects uh, the degree to which we can be a blessing to the kingdom of God. It affects how what we do with, as a family. It affects our education choices many times. It affects so many areas of our lives. And so money answers everything. Anything where money is a medium of exchange and is a player, money answers all things. You can't even preach the gospel for free. The gospel is free in one sense, in the sense that it doesn't cost to receive and to be saved and to come into the night. It doesn't cost money, as it were, for a person to receive the wonderful salvation of Jesus Christ. The power of the Holy Spirit doesn't cost you a dime. Thank God for that. However, it does cost you to propagate the gospel. It costs to, to have buildings, and it costs to have facilities, and it costs to have microphones and sound systems. Right? Come on, all that stuff, all of it, every single thing, the chairs you're sitting on, the little number that's on the chair that you don't even pay attention to, but there's a little number right in the middle of that chair, that plate costs somebody. There was a manufacturer that charged to make that little plate and charged the chair maker for that. They didn't put that on there for free. Everything about every area of our life has almost everything has some kind of cost. Money isn't everything, but in the natural, it's a whole lot of things. Come on, am I right about it? And you know as good as, as well as I do that the only reason that some of you went to school for more than four years or six years or seven, the only reason, because you don't like school that much, the only reason you went to school more is because you knew that by increasing your status education-wise or your certifications, come on, or your degrees, that you knew that it would have uh, the, the potential not only of helping you walk down a greater level of fulfillment if you're in your purpose and open doors for you to walk and exercise your gift, but you also know that that degree will mean more money. Is that right? And so there's nothing wrong with that in that sense. In fact, we're going to see that uh, God's attitude and position with respect to that. Number two, here's another reason why we're going to deal with this topic, I believe, all three reasons. God uses money as a measurement of our spiritual condition. He uses money as a measurement of our spiritual condition. Now today, uh, we, we won't get into all of this. We will cost, cost a couple of, of several weeks here, a couple of weeks. However, you can see, for example, in the New Testament, you hear statements like, he that is faithful over little shall be faithful in much. What is that talking about? And many other scriptures like that, God actually uses money as a measurement, a barometer, as it were, for our spiritual condition. Very, very interesting. And then a third reason is that this. Money is, there is this is your first writing, there is both a natural and a spiritual side to money. There is both a natural and a spiritual side to money. And that's also why we're going to deal with this subject. Because money isn't just a natural thing. It's not just about dollars and cents. There's a spiritual side to money. And as a Christian, as a disciple of Jesus Christ, and when you're talking about a subject that Jesus actually talks a whole lot about, then you need to be aware of both sides of money, the spiritual side as well as the natural side. That is so important that we know both. Now, to really get the most out of today, there's really three things that you need to know as we talk about this subject today, the prosperous soul. And we're going to unpackage and unwrap each of these three. And here's the first one. Number one, God wants you to prosper financially more than you do. Come on, you missed a really good place. If Listen, if you only had one amen in you today, that was a really good place to go ahead and let it rip right there. Praise God. No, really, it's very true that God actually wants you to prosper financially more than you do. More than you do. Number two, most of what we think to be money shortage problems are actually spiritual and soulish problems. Uh, that is, beliefs. There are problems with beliefs. There are problems with wrong perspectives. There are problems with negative emotions. 
related to money. They are related to lack of purpose. They are related to identity issues. They are related to fears, et cetera, et cetera. These are soulish issues or sometimes spiritual issues. And so it is really important that we learn to appreciate that what we think, man, if I just had more money, sometimes having more money will not solve an issue if it's in your soul. Now, I don't, I, you know, I don't, you know, we say people that preach and stand up in front of people say things like, I don't want to get ahead of myself, but I'm going to go ahead and get ahead of myself. I don't know why we say that, because then we go ahead and say it anyway. But, but, but how, many have ever, how many have ever heard about this, where someone wins a lottery? And it went, say, a lump sum, or we call it a, a, what, a windfall. We would call it a sudden, massive influx of money. And let's just say that for whatever reasons, they had not been used to handling that kind of money. In other words, they haven't operated at that level. They haven't talked at that level. Uh, they've never managed at that level. Then what has been what has been found, and this is you can read, you can go on Google, internet, newspaper, and read dozens of stories like this all day long. You could read this. That what has happened in many cases. I just read about one the other day, where in this case, a woman won about I don't know uh, somebody won. I think it was about five point eight million, something like that. Five point eight million, and and within a year and uh, six months, eighteen months, gone. Absolutely gone. Now, you say, Pastor Tom, man, I'm telling you, if you give me, man, if you give me 5.4 million, I'm telling you, it will not be gone. Well, I don't know. Maybe it will. Maybe it wouldn't. It depends on the condition of your soul. And so, and so see, my money didn't necessarily help them. It wasn't a money issue. It was a soul issue. And, uh, and, and so we, we need to understand that. And then number three, when we become whole and properly aligned with truth in our spirit and soul, our finances will begin to reflect what we are on the inside. Praise God. Now, we're all at some place along the other. Most of us, the average person, you know, like a bell curve, right? Most people are not on the extremes of either or anything that we'll talk about. Most of us as a whole, as a whole, body of Christ as a whole, and that's intentionally who I'm talking to, in particular, the, those that are already saved, to have a relationship with God. If you don't, you'll have an opportunity today. But for the most part, most of us are right under the bell curve, somewhere along the line, uh, but I tell you what, we all can improve. Come on, wherever we are, how many know there's always room for improvement? And the other thing is this. Finances has been such a trouble area in the lives of many, 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 many people. Maybe even you right now are feeling the pain of it in some kind of way. And listen, part of what we're called to do as a church is we want to help people in four ways. And listen, to, number two is what? To what? Find freedom. Everyone say find freedom. So God wants us to be free in this particular area so that it is not an area of pain, not an area of bondage, not an area of, of disappointment and fear, but God wants every one of his children to experience freedom in the area of finances. Now, that's not about a dollar amount. That is first a soul issue and a spiritual issue, all right? And then we'll talk about some other things from the natural side. Today, we're going to deal mostly, I can tell you, from the spiritual and soulish side of that. Now, all right, let's look at our next section here. God wants you to prosper financially. I want you to say that. I want you to point to yourself, point right to yourself. Come on with authority and say, God wants me to prosper financially. Amen. Praise God. Praise God. Now, those of you that have been around Impact Church, and even when we were Faith Christian Center, see, the one thing you know about, uh, about our church, you know about me as a pastor, you know that when it comes to the, this subject of money, you know that uh, our style is to teach you right from God's Word. Amen? 
and to teach you, give you a balanced, full perspective on what God says on any subject. You know, because uh, unfortunately, when you sometimes when you talk about money and finances, sometimes because of extremes of one end or the other, people can get kind of nervous and a little up agitated. But I believe the core of that church, of our church, that kind of has been washed away for those that have been around here for a while. But if you're newer to church or newer, and maybe I heard this and that, this, that, and the other, listen, listen, we're going to teach you right from the Word of God. You can relax, open up your heart, just get ready to receive and be blessed by God. It'll encourage you and bless your life. All right, so God wants you to prosper financially. Now, here's what I'm doing. I'm just going to give you several texts. These are kind of proof texts. There, we could go through hundreds of these, literally. But I'm only going to give you just a few for the sake of time from different spaces in the Bible. Here's Deuteronomy chapter 8, verses 7 through 10. All right, so let's look at Deuteronomy chapter 8, verses 7 through 10. And I'm going to look at these out of the, uh, the New King James. All right, so you got it up there. Oh, no, okay. They just got my note as it is there. So to turn in your Bible there to Deuteronomy chapter 8, verses 7 through 10. We're going to look right there. Deuteronomy 8, verses 7 through 10. All right, so here we go. It says in verse number 7, For the Lord your God bring you in, brings you into a good land, a land of brooks and of water, of fountains and depths that spring out of valleys and hills, a land of wheat and barley and vines and fig trees and pomegranates, a land of olive oil and honey, a land wherein, listen to this verse 9, you shall eat bread without scarcity. Come on, that means no shortage. Everyone say no shortage. Listen to this. Come on. You shall not lack what? You shall lack nothing in the land. Think of that. This is God talking to his people. You will lack nothing in the land that I give you. Nothing. Now this is God directly first person talking. And here's my will for you. You lack nothing in that land. A land whose stones are iron and out of whose hills you may dig brass. And then verse 10 says, and when you have eaten and you are full, then you shall do what? Bless the Lord your God for the good land which he have given you. Praise God. And then let's go down to uh, later in that, let's go down to verse number 18. Look at verse 18. Let's read that together. Ready? Read. And you shall remember the Lord your God. For it is he who gives you power to get wealth that he may establish his covenant which he swore to your fathers as it is this day. All right? Joshua 1 and 8. We're just going to quickly look at these. This is just to remind ourselves of what God's will is concerning you financially. God wants you to prosper financially. Joshua 1 and 8. Verse 8 says, This book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate in it when? Day and night, that you may observe to do according to all that is written in, for then you will make your way what? Come on, you'll make your way what? Prosperous, and then you will have what? Good success. So here's God instigating Joshua and the children of Israel prospering and having good success, and he's the instigator behind it. Then go over to Psalm number 35. Psalm number 35. 35, and there we're going to look at verse number 27. Psalm number 35, verse number 27. God wants you to prosper financially. Yes, he does. I'm so excited about this word today. Because I know what's coming. I know what the Holy Spirit is going to do in your heart. This is a heart issue. It's not a dollar and cent issue. It's a heart issue. It's a soul issue. And I already know what he's going to do in the heart of our church. And I know what he's going to do in the soul of the people in our church. Everyone connected here. I know what he's going to do through this word. All right, Psalm number 35 and verse number 27. Let's read it together. Ready, read. Let them shout for joy and be glad. Well, just go ahead and shout then real quick. Hallelujah! 
I, we might as well, since it said, let them shout for joy. Who favor my righteous cause, David said. Let them say continually, let the Lord be magnified. Who has what? Pleasure in the prosperity of his servant. Pleasure? That pleases him. Makes him happy. You know, when something brings you pleasure, that makes you glad. Makes you happy. Right? I mean, how, how many of you ever eaten a really pleasant, pleasing meal to your taste buds? And you've eaten that meal, and you say, oh, that was so good, I'll never do this again. Huh? Who's ever done that? No one's ever done that. In fact, if that was your response, you'd be saying, man, I can't wait till the next time we get to come back and experience this again. Something that is pleasing to you, you want to experience that more and more and more. And so God says, I am pleased when my servants, that's what they call them under the Old Testament, now we're children of God. But when my servants prosper, we're children who serve. Praise God. But they were servants, but not children. All right, let's move on. Proverbs 8. Proverbs chapter 8, we're going to look at verses 21 and 22. How are you guys hearing me? It sounds pretty good from here. All right, so pretty solid, all right? So praise God, hope it's all, all working out up there. Proverbs 8, 21 and 22. Proverbs 8, 21 says, this is, now this is wisdom talking. Really, it's the wisdom of God. How I many you know it's the wisdom of God talking? This is, the, this is the heart and mind of God talking. And wisdom is kind of personified like a person. Here it's actually like a, a woman called the woman, the wisdom. And uh, it's personified as a woman, the voice of a of wise woman. But here's what we say. We know it's the heart of God speaking to us. And it says, verse 21, that I may cause those who love me to what? To inherit wealth. And what? That I may feel their treasures, that I may feel their treasures. All right, just 21 is all we really need there. That I may cause those who love me to inherit wealth. All right, then New Testament, 2 Corinthians chapter 8. 2 Corinthians chapter 8. Why are we looking at these uh, scriptures? And as I was uh, preparing and meditating and studying from all kinds of angles, this is what I had this impression in my heart. Give my people the word. Give them the word. In other words, give them scripture to, to, to renew their minds and to build within my people to establish them in truth so that the enemy cannot easily convince them and push them over and so that they cannot be tricked by ideas, concepts, philosophies of men that would try to trick you. If you don't know the truth, then you are pray for deception. Or, watch this, if you don't know the truth, you are pray for well-intended people who mean well and are still wrong. They're nice about it, kind, believe they're giving you just good, but wrong is a, a $7 bill. And so, so you have to watch subtle things that will come to you like, well, you know, uh, if you, uh, Christians shouldn't be thinking about money. But, you know, little, little subtle statements like that. Well, up upon what basis do you, do you derive that idea? Now, I know a lot of times when people come from that direction, really what they're saying is that Christians shouldn't be covetous. Amen. Covetous means greedy, uh, meaning all about materialism, meaning all about that, all about consumption. No, Christians shouldn't be that. However, if you just stop and think about it, no, I'm getting ready to get ahead of myself. This time I'm going to stop myself. I'm going to stop myself this time. Let's come on. Let's read this. Let's read this. 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 9. Let's read it together. Uh, ready? Read. Yep. He became poor that you, through his poverty, might become rich. Come on, we're just reading right out of the Bible. 
Now, I tell you, when you read scriptures like this, it'll mess with your theology. And it'll mess with you and your emotions because, see, here's what we're going to see is that a lot of, again, where we are has to do with our thinking on the inside. So when you read scriptures like that, it'll challenge you. Because you say, well, wait a minute, I'm not experiencing that. All right? So if I'm experiencing that, maybe that's extreme. Maybe it doesn't just mean what it says. Maybe it just means that, you know, you'll be doing all right. Maybe it doesn't mean that. But you see, we never want to reduce God's word to the standard of our experience. That's always an error to take the word and reduce it down to the level of my personal experience. No, no, no. What we want to do is say, wow, if, 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 if an area of God's word is much higher, the standard, the, 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 the table that he said is much higher than my personal experience, wow, let me run into my prayer closet. Let me t open my Bible. Let me ask the Holy Spirit to help my understanding. Let me pray, let me seek, let me meditate on his word. God, I'm not experiencing this standard. So Holy Spirit, help me to see what I'm not seeing. So that I can, so that I can experience the standard that you have set for me in any area of life. That's how you want to take the word. Never reduce it to what you're personally experiencing. If what you're experiencing isn't the standard there of Scripture. Now listen, I put this in your notes because I thought it was important. Uh, the word uh, rich there, it's, uh, it's, the Greek word isn't important as much as, it, as much as it, what it means. It's the Greek word plutio, plutio. Everyone say plutio. I'm going to tell you why that's connected to an English word in just a moment. But here's what it means. I even gave you the Strong's Concordance Greek number. Strong's is a Bible concordance that you can look up any word in the English Old or New Testament. And if you look up that word, if it's a New Testament word, it'll give you the meaning of that word in its original language. And the reason that's important is because sometimes you can get an understanding that's sort of just blind to you if you just read it right out of the Bible. Old or New Testament. All right, so here's what this word rich means. It literally means to become wealthy. Literally or figuratively, to be increased with goods, to be made or to wax rich. And then here's Thayer's definition. To be rich, to have abundance of outward possessions. A metaphor. To be richly supplied, to be affluent in resources, so that he can give blessings of salvation to all. Now we know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. That though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor. That you through his poverty might be made rich, might have an abundance of outward possessions, might be richly supplied, might be affluent in resources so that you can have and be a blessing to give the blessing of salvation to all mankind. All right? So that is there, black and white, right there in the scripture. Now, prosperity has, here's your next write in, a purpose. Write that in. Prosperity has a purpose. Say prosperity has a purpose. And, and, and before we, we go there, um, I thought that's interesting. He became poor that we might be made rich. Now, you know, I've heard it taught and understood different ways. Well, how was Jesus poor? When was he poor? And well, one, one way I've kind of understood it is that, you know, Jesus became poor uh, upon his submission to the death of the cross. Uh, he became poor in that sense. He took upon poverty and shame and, and our sickness and all of that. Uh, others have understood it this way, saying that relative to heaven, the earth was poor. Even with all his needs met and an abundance. Personally, as you know, I've said this before, in one sense, Jesus was beyond money. You, why, how do you say that, Pastor Tom? Because anytime you can stand before 5,000 men, not to mention women and children, and recognize that they're hungry, and say to yourself, you know what, I tell you what, just give me the five loaves and two fish, that'll be enough. I'm so dialed into heaven. I'm so clear of who I am as a son of God. I'm so clear on the Father's good-natured heart. 
I so know how he wants to bless them. See, I'm clear in that. And I know how rich and how awesome and how unlimited he is by natural circumstances. See, I'm clear on that. This is how Jesus is saying. And since I'm clear on that, actually all I need to do is take the little that seems like it's not enough, lift it up to heaven, bring it, watch this, under the jurisdiction of the kingdom now. Because long as it's in man's hands only, it's in that world system, which is not enough. But when I take it and bless it and give thanks for it and bring it up to God, it now transforms governments. Now it's under the government of God, where in heaven there is no lack. And because he's clear on that, that's what gave him the nerve to actually believe that. And when you're clear on things like that, it'll give you a lot of nerve that you may not even have right now. See, clarity on how good God is. Clarity on who you are in your identity. Clarity on how much he ridiculously loves you. Clarity on how close he is to you right now. Clarity on how much details of your life he's actually interested in will make you have a whole lot of daring and boldness about you that maybe right now you're not experiencing. But because of that, what did he do? Bread and the food multiplied in the disciples' hands because he's training them. And how many were fed? 5, 10, 15, could have been 20,000. How many know when you can feed 20,000 without a checkbook, you're beyond money? That would have, would have been reasonable if someone had said, you know what, we've been planning for this. We just, I was led by the Spirit. I was anticipating that we probably would have a really big crowd. So our ministry, our organization, our charity has been saving for the last six months. And I mean, we just get a lot of people are very generous in our, in our organization. So we got more, just only took us six months enough to feed and set aside for all of these people. 20, 30,000 people to eat. And we got the money aside. It's on the check. It's in the bank right now. Just go ahead and bring the care in, bring all the food in, and we'll go ahead and pay for it. Now, what would have been wrong with that? Nothing. Nothing would have been wrong with that. But see, that required money. Jesus was beyond money. Anytime the tax guy comes to you and says, does your master pay taxes? He said, yeah. He prevented Peter. Nope. Don't go in the treasury and get it. I want you to go to the lake. I want you to drop your net or your line, whichever tool you're using. Drop that out there. Get a fish. Pull the first fish out of the water. Open it up and get the coin out. That'll be enough for me and for you. Take care of that. And why? Now why? The man's got the money. Why isn't he paying it natural? Because he's showing you when you're connected with God. When you're dialed in with him, he can provide supernaturally. And it's not about need all the time. Because he didn't have a need naturally. He had the money. That's why he told Peter he prevented him is what the King James said. I mean, he stopped him. No, don't do it this way. I'm going to show you I'm beyond money. And yet he used actual coinage with Caesar's face on it so it didn't get counterfeit out of heaven. But the point is how he accessed it was beyond the natural. He's beyond money. The Bible's not shy about telling you about how much money people have. Bible, in fact, we don't talk enough about money in church. And that's why we suffer in that area. Because we've allowed the devil to make us think of something sinister or greedy or bad or this and that why everybody's hurting and in pain and can't afford this and dealing with this and, and oppressed by this. Yeah, people commit suicide over money. People get divorced over money. Come on, all kind of negative stuff happens because of being dominated by it instead of dominating it. But it's a soul issue that we got to get free in. But the Bible isn't shy about telling people about uh, how much money people have. It tells you Abraham told you he had a certain amount of cattle and sheep and this, that, and the other. And then in Genesis 24, it says Abraham was very rich. It told you exactly how many heads of, of camels and donkeys and she donkeys that Job had. Told you exactly how many he had. Which meant in today's terms, that'd be like a small trucking company, be like a long term, uh, you know, 18 wheeler truck. It'd be like all these kind of modern materials and machinery. He had a fleet of them. 
And you can pretty much calculate somebody's net wealth from their business just by then telling you right in plain black and white. The Bible's not shy about that. The Bible's not shy about telling you how much every year they were bringing into Solomon's kingdom. Read 1 Kings chapter 7, 8, and 9. Told you by the exact amount how much they were bringing in. The Bible's not shy about telling how much how rich somebody is. The Bible's not shy about, uh, uh, who else was it, David in 1 Chronicles chapter 29, the offering that they gave. It told you the exact amount. You can translate it today in dollars and account for inflation. You can come up with every number we might come up with, but it was probably in the billions, that offering that they gave. And then it said, David said, out of my own treasure, because of my affection for the house of God, I'm going to give. And then he told the people exactly how much he was giving. Okay, I'm not prescribing. What I'm saying is that the Bible's not shy in talking about money. Talked about these people's portfolios, as it were, and yet doesn't say anything about Jesus' portfolio. And Jesus says, a greater than Solomon is on the scene. Now, you think Solomon or something? I mean, Jesus said, but I'm a greater than Solomon is here, and I'm him. Why didn't they tell us about Jesus' portfolio? Because in the examples that I just gave, do you understand that man is beyond money? Why would you talk about his portfolio when, the man, when he's so hooked up to heaven and that can happen? When you go to a wedding and it's not even supposed to be your time yet. And they ran out of wine. You all know the story. This is John chapter 2. And he's, they, they're running out of wine. His mother comes up to him. She's got something to do, I guess, with assisting in the, in the, in the party. And she says, son, yes, mother. They've run out of wine. Okay. And what does that have to do with me? My time has not come because as a son is 30 years old, he knew exactly what she meant. She's thinking to herself, now all these prophecies that I've been reading about and all these angels visiting me and Joseph and all this and you to Christ and it's time to you to do something now, buddy. Come on, bring it. You know, like a mama probably would. Probably would. And he said, well, my time has not come. Well, somewhere between him saying, my time has not come, and her saying, whatever he tells you to do, go ahead and do it. Now, somewhere between then and there, it became the will of God. I don't know if it was the will of God or mama's persistence that made it the will of God. Here's the point. They brought out six containers that was about 120 gallons of water. And they filled them all up to the top. Jesus did something, told him, now nah, take it to the governor of the feast and tell him to taste it. And then he said, oh my goodness. He said, man, this is the best I've ever tasted. He said, and not only that, you know, usually what people do, he said, usually they put the good stuff out and have the cheap stuff at the end. He said, you saved the best for it. Now listen, listen, I'm not a wine drinker. But you see, I'm intelligent and I pay attention to menus and I look at stuff and I observe my world. And sometimes when we're in fine restaurants, I just look down the list. Sometimes the wine thing is that thick and the food is this thick. I said, man, where you make your money at on this or this? So, you know, I just, I just glanced down. It's just interesting and fascinating to me. Wow, $270 a bottle. Wow. Oh, that one's, wow, $1,100 a bottle. Wow. You know, or everything in between. Now, here's the point. Do you understand, in the natural, those things can cost a lot. A bottle can cost a lot. Do you understand that this governor said, this is the best stuff I ever tasted, and it was 120 gallons? We went to a restaurant where they said one bottle was $10,000. And it's just a regular size bottle. So how much would 120 gallons of that cost? All I'm saying to you is I, I, want you, I need you to look at those things and not just see them as, oh, that's a neat story. You need to see your Lord and Savior, the captain of your salvation, the one that you are hooked up to, the one that 1 John 4, 17 and 18 says, as he is, so am I in this world. You need to understand, he is beyond money. And you need to personally identify with him. In your prayer time, see yourself connected with him and not alone in this world. Whoever calls upon the name of the Lord, it says, shall be what? Saved. That's a verse in, in Romans 10, 13. Let me tell you about this word, saved. 
It's the Greek word sozo. And, and it carries all of these other meanings. In addition to salvation from, from eternal death, eternal life, it, it means to be healed, to be preserved. It means to save, to make well, to make whole, to protect, to deliver, and to prosper. All of that is built in the word sozo or save. Whosoever shall call on the Lord, name of the Lord shall be what? Come on. How many of you are saved? Raise your hand if you're saved. Well, if you're saved, guess what? That means built into salvation in Christ is the potential to walk in the fullness of everything that word means. Which means to be made well, to be whole, to prosper, to be at peace. All of that is wrapped in the word salvation, which means don't just stop at being saved from hell for heaven. Sozo includes all of that. All right? I mean, you know, when you get a new job and you ask about the benefits, and you learn that you got four weeks of vacation, how many know you're not taking two days off that year? Come on, am I right about it? How many, how many of you know if, if unless, you know, something you know, prevents it. You're taking all four weeks. Hmm? There'll be no carryover into 2018. Because why? You want all of your benefits. Prosperity has a purpose. And here's, what I, <clears throat> here's where we are with this. Prosperity has a purpose. 1 Timothy 6, 17 through 19. And I have this written out here. Let's read that together. Ready, read. Command those not to be haughty, nor to trust in uncertain riches, but in the living God who gives us richly all things to enjoy. Let them do good that they may be rich in what? Good works. What? Ready to give, willing to share, storing up for themselves a good foundation for the time to come that they may lay hold on to eternal life. And I'm telling you, here it is, man, in a nutshell. Of if, if I had to boil down one reason, I could give you 20 more, but here's one scripture. Scriptures, I can give you 20 scriptures. Here's one. Why God wants you to prosper more than you do so you can be in this position right here. Because charge those that are rich in this world. Number one, not get all haughty and trusting in your riches. In other words, don't let your confidence and your peace be in your riches. Let your peace be in the Lord. Let your confidence be in him. Come on, someone. And listen, listen, those that have a lot of money are not the only ones potentially guilty of this. Wherever you are in your growth, in your financial scenery, picture, all of us can be guilty of trusting in riches, even if we say we're not rich. Because all of a sudden, if you've been struggling, and now an extra $80 come in. And all of a sudden, are you now at Peace. I'm not talking to well, if something extra come in, you I'll be happy. There's nothing wrong with that. You follow what I'm saying? But I mean, are you now at peace and feel greater security? Because there's a difference. And I think you know what I'm talking about. Well, in other words, when your sense of you know security rises and falls with that, see, those are those soul issues that God wants to heal us of and get us free of so that money is not controlling us. Because if you're not free, money controls you whether you have a lot or a little. It tells you what to do. Because if I'm not whole, it, I, I'm using it to try to be whole or secure or safe or not afraid. Or at the other extreme, we're going to talk about two spirits. One is the spirit of poverty, the other is the spirit of mammon. On the other one, I try to uh, present, uh, I try to... Uh, to uh, affirm my worth, my value, by what I have. Either way, if I'm not whole, and I don't have my identity right, I could be manipulated by one of those two spirits. No matter how much money I have or don't. Yep. Yeah, yeah. So, so, so God wants us to be free in this. So here's the thing. And listen, let them do good, that they may be what? Rich. Oh, man. Oh, man. Look at me. Rich in what? Catch this. Let those who are rich in finances 
be rich in what? Good works. See, he's telling you the clue to the highest use of being rich. So you can be rich in good works. Why? Why, Paul? Well, so that they're ready to give, willing to share. Well, what's the result of this? Verse 19 is the result. Storing up. Storing up. In their 501k? No, 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 no. Storing up for themselves what? A good foundation for the time to come. That they may lay hold onto eternal life. You know what he's saying? That the highest use of money is when you use money to affect eternity. When you use money to change someone's life and affect their eternal position. When you use money to minister the salvation of Jesus Christ or the mercy of Jesus Christ or the provision and the, and the deliverance of Jesus Christ because that money can translate to all kind of forms of ministry. When you build a home for orphans who are, who are fatherless or motherless and therefore without a sense of identity but you are being the hands of Jesus because you're rich and you can actually build a house. Now you are affecting children and affecting their eternal destiny. And here's what the Apostle Paul, and very, not meant, now we don't understand this as much as we need to, but through this series, I believe God will give us more light. That the money and prosperity, and if you've been around the body of Christ for the last 30 years, and you've gotten, you've been around places where we've gotten revelation, thank God that God wants us to prosper, God doesn't have pleasure in us being broke. You see, some place, sometimes we stop at God just wants us to prosper. But it's, it's never was just about that. It was for a purpose, and maybe that purpose, I don't think my own personal opinion didn't get emphasized strong enough that it was for not only now, not only, but also laying a foundation for the time to come. Let me tell you something, dear friend. You'll hear these words in eternity, that you're going to live much longer in eternity than you are right now. And only what you do for Christ will last. And I'm telling you that the highest use of money is to use it in a way that it affects people for eternity. And when your money, when you're giving, that's why you're tithing and you're giving, all of that isn't just about now. You are laying a foundation. Listen, the level of reward that you experience eternally is connected to what you do with your finances. It's not just about having enough needs to take care of your family. It's also about your eternal reward. And what Paul is revealing is that if you learn how to use money, you're not only going to be blessed here. Yeah, praise God. Live in the land that God wants you to live. Walk how God wants you to walk. Drive how God you know, wants you to drive. Be a great witness. Matt, you know, how he wants to use you. But the biggest thing is what it will do for you eternally and have the privilege of. Remember, Jesus says this in one of his parables. Well done, good and faithful servant. You've been faithful over a little bit, and the parable was centered around money. Now enter into the joy of the Lord. Now the greatest blessing is now is that you can rule and reign with him at a, le at a level that you've never imagined. So this is part of the big reason why God wants you to be rich. 2 Corinthians chapter 9. We're going to wrap up here, here in a second. 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 8 through 10. Is this helping anyone today? 2 Corinthians 9, 8 through 10. It says, And God is able to make all grace abound toward you, so that you always having all sufficiency in all things may abound to every good work. As it is written, well, just stop right there. All grace abound toward you, that you may have all sufficiency in how many things? You may abound to what? Every good work. And uh, the Amplified, uh, I love how the Amplified, the Amplified says it this way. He says, in in that same verse, it says, possessing enough to require no aid or support and furnished in abundance for every good work and charitable donation. In other words, whenever there's a good work that's needed, you've got the resources. As it is written, he's dispersed abroad, he's given to the poor, his righteousness endures forever. Now, may he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food supply and multiply the seed you sown and increase the fruits of your righteousness. That's what he's saying. In other words, the end result is more praise will be given to God. So there's a purpose for God prospering you. And there's a reason why as a Christian, you should want to be rich. 
You see, watch this. Even saying that right here from my position, just in certain places, it could just create little funny feelings. People, as a Christian, you should want to be rich. Rich is not a bad word. No, it's not. You see, part of the other problem is we have sort of an Americanized Western concept of rich. Because we, you know, watch TV and lottery and you drive down the street and uh, such and such lotto, $300 million. Well, rich means abundantly supplied for more than you need and you can have, be a blessing to supply in somebody else's life. That's a relative term. So that's relative to different people, to different capacities, to different assignments. But the point is, God wants you rich. Say it out loud. God wants me to be rich. All right. Amen. Amen. Now, I, I promise this is my last scripture. And it's 3 John, verse 2. Turn your page over. This is your last insert for today. 3 John. I'm going to look at verse 2. Is this helping you today? 3 John, verse 2. <clears throat> now watch this. Here's your right end. Listen to this. Your inner life sets the pace for your outer life. Your inner life, I-N-N-E-R, life, sets the pace for your outer life. I'll pick up strongly on this next week. But here's the verse, 3 John, verse 2. Read it with me together. Come on, come on, team. Let's read it. Ready? Go. All right. Well, it sounded like a couple hundred of us reading all at different times. Let's try that one more time. Come on. Come on. Ready? Go. Beloved, I pray that you may prosper and be in health. Just as your soul prospers. Your inner life sets the pace for your outer life. In other words, you will prosper and be in health even to the degree that your soul prospers. Your soul, your thinking, your mentality, how you think sets the pace for what you experience. And when it comes to our financial life, the more we, the more we renew our thinking, our inner life, the more it reflects in our outer. Your soul is the pace setter. Your inner life sets the pace for your outer life. I was telling Pastor Steph the other day that uh, we're just talking, hanging out, whatever. And, um, somehow the subject of recreation came up. And I said, you know, one of these days, uh, I said, I really want to go to on those big time auto races. I've been to Formula One races, Grand Prix. I said, I want to go to. I said, here we are living in uh, Tampa, Florida. And I said, we've been here all this time. I said, I've never gone to Daytona. I said, we got to get over there. It was February. The Daytona 500 was just coming up that weekend. I said, you know, I'm going to get over to that race. There are other races there. I said, I got to get over there one day. And sure enough, I went online, went on Facebook, and here's my childhood friend that I grew up with uh, on my street. We were seven, eight years old. Here he is on Facebook like this at the Daytona 500. I said, man, are you kidding me? Sure enough, right? And so I said, wow. And then I thought about this verse. In these kind of races and others, at certain times, there's a car that comes out in front of all of the field of cars, and it's called the pace car. And it, they, they do it. For one of the times they do it is at the beginning of the race. You see, they don't, just, they, don't, they don't just get out there and haul off and everybody just takes off. They have certain positions that they're in based on certain pre preliminary races. Or, or, or positions. And then there's a car that just sort of goes in front, and they're the pace car, the pace setter. And what happens is none of the cars behind them can go in front of that car. And at the beginning of the race, when uh, the official uh, raises and waves the, the, the flag to go green, go, let's start, guess what? Boom, they take off. And that pace car gets out of the way, and they're off to the races, literally. All right? The pace setter determines how fast everybody's going. No one can go in front of the pace car. Your soul is the pace setter for your life. Your life cannot go beyond the pace of your thinking. Your thinking is the pace setter. 
and your life cannot outrace your thinking. So if your thinking is at a low level, your outer life cannot go beyond that for any considerable length of time. It has to fall back in pace to the inner man. That's why when some people have won the lottery and their inner man was still at a certain level, their inner man made the arrangements through their beliefs, their actions, their attitudes, and their behavior that forced their outer life to look like what they are inside. Even if it goes from five, eight, nine, ten million to nothing in two years. Because there's a law that says it must reflect what you are inside. God wants to set us free inside and raise the level of our thinking so that our outer world can begin to reflect it. Amen. Come on, let's, let's stand to our feet. That's it for today. Praise God. Did you get anything out of the word today?